It sounds good. Thank you. Well, hello, everybody. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us today. I am Kathleen Borain, and I serve as the Maryland Insurance Commissioner. Um, you know, every year, pretty much, the Insurance Administration will hold a life and health and a property and casualty industry meeting. Um, a key purpose of that is to walk through the legislative le legislation that has just recently passed and talk about what we're doing to implement that legislation. Um, it's also a good opportunity to share with you reports and other um, items that we've been asked to work on in the interim by members of the General Assembly. Uh, it also gives us an opportunity to hear concerns, both from companies and those consumers that join about um, the regulation of the property and casualty insurance marketplaces. So today is the PNC industry meeting, and you can view our agenda by clicking on the link in the chat box. Um, I'm just going to go over a few procedures that will just make it easier for the recording and for us to proceed um, easily today. So this is a virtual meeting, obviously. It's being held via the Zoom webinar platform, and it is being recorded. The video and sound recording will be made available on the MIA's website within the next few days. Um, we will open up the meeting for questions and comments toward the end. If you wish to be heard, then please let us know via the chat function or the hand raise option. And as time and technology allow, we will then call on you in turn, unmute your line to allow you to speak. Um, we do ask that in, to ensure really good sound quality throughout the meeting, that you please stay on mute unless you are speaking. So with that, let me just take a moment to start by introducing uh, the members of the MIA team who are with us in today's meeting. So uh, Bill Fawcett, who is our Associate Commissioner for Property and Casualty, Mary Quay, the Associate Commissioner for Market Regulation and Professional Licensing, Joy Hatchett, the Associate Commissioner for Consumer Education and Advocacy, Jamie Sexton, currently Director, soon to be Associate Commissioner, yes, you heard that here first publicly, right? Uh, but currently Director of Legislative and Regulatory Policy, Riley Williams, the Assistant Director of Legislative and Regulatory Policy, Bill Pearson, who is our Deputy Principal Counsel within the Office of the Attorney General, and last but never least, Craig I, who is our Chief for Communications and Public Engagement. So what I'd like to do is, first of all, in addition to just thanking you all for being here, I'm going to turn this over to our team to walk us through the agenda. And uh, Mary and Bill, if you could start us off with an update on the MIA's response to the Francis Scott Key Bridge collapse, that would be appreciated. Thank you. I will start by doing talking about our data call. Uh, the purpose of the data call is to identify and be able to answer questions about some of the economic impacts of the collapse of the key bridge and the insurance to help with that, perhaps. Um, so we send out a data call to selected carriers for information on claims arising from the collapse of the key bridge and the subsequent reductions in operations at the Port of Baltimore. This is an ongoing data call as we expect that claims will come in over time and it may be open for, and the claims may be open for some time. The first responses are due on June 15th. We anticipate and so have so far seen that most of the claims are for business interruption coverage but we are interested in the full array of claims that may come in. If you are in a line of business where you have claims or expect to have claims and did not receive the data call, please let me know so that we can update your contact information. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Uh, I just wanted to add my thanks, first of all, to uh, all of you who've been participating in our collection of, of data prior to the, the data call. And, uh, and even more importantly, I wanted to thank you for the accommodations that, that you've made for the citizens of Maryland that have been impacted by, by the bridge collapse. Um, I received responses from 84 of you with, uh, with good detail, which we used to inform the other members of the MIA and the, and the Maryland government in, in general. So, uh, and several of you also spent 
time with me on calls talking in, in more detail uh, about uh, your exposures, uh, as well as helping us prepare that data call. So I wanted to thank you for that. And, um, and uh, again, remind you, as, as Mary had said, that the, uh, the data call that went out the first of the month is due on the 15th. So thank you again for that. Yeah, thank you, Bill and Mary. And, and let me just echo um, our appreciation both for the feedback that some of the carriers gave as we developed the data call and tried to right size the questions. And those of you who have made accommodations and, and frankly, just your generosity of time and information as we tried to stay ahead of this from an insurance perspective. I, and I want to continue to assure people that, as Mary said, um, this is not a, an exercise in, in, frankly, forcing coverage, but it is an exercise in understanding impacts and where coverage doesn't exist. And, you know, we should never let, um, a, you know, a crisis go to waste. This is a terrible event, and it follows a terrible event in the, in the nature of the pandemic, also with very little options for many businesses as it relates to business interruption coverage. So, as we think about where those gaps are and how we fill them and what makes sense, this type of data and understanding what is out there, what is paying, what is not, is really, really important. One of the reasons that I um, asked and was very pleased that Bill was able to come on board with us is because of his background in developing insurance financing solutions. And so traditional insurance is not necessarily gonna respond to everything but we can be creative as we think about ways to create payment mechanisms that are not purely loans or purely reactive. So this data that you're pulling together in a, in a very high and aggregate de-identified type form, I hope will inform some of that thinking as we think about what kinds of risk pools and what kinds of products need to begin to exist, particularly for smaller, mid-sized, vulnerable businesses. Um, when they have losses that are not the result of a physical incident. So again, thank you for your generosity and information. Um, I'm now gonna turn it over to Jamie and her team um, as folks walk through the 2024 PNC legislative update. Thanks, Jamie. Thank you so much, Kathleen. Um, so everyone, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, we are gonna go over a few pieces of legislation that are particularly pertinent for this group that's joining us. Um, please note that this is not going to be as in-depth as our end-of-session bulletin will be that is being released this week. Um, we encourage you to review that when that gets posted. Um, I assume that you are all on our mailing list, and if you aren't, I would encourage you to get on it so that you see the notification when that does go out. Um, so we're going to touch on a few high-level bills today and then open the, um, there'll be an opportunity for questions on them should there be any. Uh, first up, we have House Bill 36. This is an MIA departmental bill uh, sponsored by Chair Wilson. Um, this deals with um, public adjusters. Um, it uh, does many things, one of which being it limits the hours during which public adjusters can solicit business by prohibiting it between 8 p.m. and 8 a.m. Um, this also lengthens and ensures right of rescission time from three business days to 10. Um, this also requires public adjusters who enter into a public adjuster contract during or within 72 hours after a loss producing event to provide notice to the insurance commissioner of entering into that contract. Please note that this bill does get into effect October 1st of this year. Uh, the MIA has been hard at work at creating that portal for which public adjusters can submit those contracts to us um, to satisfy that notification requirement. Um, as those tools become um, solidified, we'll be sure that those are released to those that will need to utilize them um, to provide that notification as required by the new law. Um, next up, we have House Bill 647. Uh, this was sponsored by Delegate Guyton. Um, this bill uh, created a new regulatory framework for pet insurance in the state of Maryland. Um, there was a, a lot of engagement on this bill this session, and we were happy to be a part of the conversations that took part around it. Um, please note that as part of the new uh, law that has gone into effect, the MIA is required to develop informational material um, about pet insurance policies that will be disseminated to vet practitioners throughout the state um, for their posting within their practices. Um, some of those on this call, we may be reaching out to in the development of those resources. So um, please take note of that fact. 
Third on the list, we have House Bill 1227. This was sponsored by Delegate Holmes. Um, there are many people on this call today that were involved in um, House Bill 98 of the 2023 legislative session. Um, this bill, House Bill 1227, sought to provide some clarity to the confusion that was created by House Bill 98 of 2023. Um, it provides that a council of unit owners may carry coverage on the entirety of all detached units located within a condominium composed of similar detached units. However, if the Council of Unit Owners does not cover the entirety of all detached units, the owner of a residential detached unit is required to carry homeowners insurance coverage on the entirety of the unit. Um, we know that there is a lot of confusion around 98. As you guys know, um, we were involved in trying to provide some clarity around that fact. We hope that this passage of this bill this year provides some more concrete clarity around that issue. Um, I know that many people on this call were very engaged on that bill this session, and we appreciated that. Um, number four on our list is House Bill 1482. This was sponsored by Delegate Fraser Hidalgo. Um, we've received a lot of outreach since session wound down from those of you on this call about this bill. Um, as part of what this new law does, it increases the uninsured penalty imposed on vehicle owners for failing to maintain required security, um, including mandatory minimum insurance coverage for a registered motor vehicle. Um, as many of you already are aware, uh, the MIA posted a bulletin, uh, it's bulletin 2414, uh, that was issued on May 29th of this year, notifying insurers that updated forms um, must be submitted for review by the PNC Rates and Forms Unit no later than June 30th. For those of you that have the penalty amount as a static field in your forms, um, we are encouraging insurers to make that filing as a standalone form filing in order to expedite our review. Um, we understand that the forms impacted by this bill have to be in use by July 1st of this year. Um, and so in light of that abbreviated time frame, um, we are um, ensuring, or excuse me, we're deeming the use of updated forms to be permissible under the state's form filing approval requirements as long as the required filing is made by June 30th of this year. So please take note of those dates. Um, Craig, if I could ask if you wouldn't mind sending um, the link to that bulletin in the chat as well for people's reference as um, they're digesting this information, that would be wonderful. Um, and then the last bill on our list today is Senate Bill 452, which was sponsored by Senator Carter. Um, this deals with prohibited liabil liability agreements for rec facilities. Um, this renders void and unenforceable contract provisions that limit the liability of a rec facility for injury caused by or resulting from the negligence or other wrongful acts of its agents or on-duty employees. Um, I know this was a lot of information very quickly. This was just intended to be a high-level review of some bills that um, we've either received outreach from um, industry about or that we recognize have an impact on industry. Um, we're happy to answer any questions you may have about them. And again, please keep an eye out for our end of session bulletin that'll be coming uh, this week. Thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm, one thing I'm sure the industry is probably aware of, but for those of you who are not, Jamie and her team do a really, really thorough job of meeting with all of the divisions and going through all the legislation that has passed and developing an implementation plan for each of those bills. So sometimes that's as simple as being aware that the bill has passed. Sometimes it involves regulation or a bulletin or you know a, a, a new type of regime. So if there are bills that you feel fall into that category where they require some form of activity, whether it's a regulation or a bulletin, um, then I would invite you to get in touch with Jamie and, and let her know and have that conversation. We've just in concluded our internal activities uh, in that regard. And um, so to the end, we're beginning to move on implementation. So if there are specific things that you want to make Jamie aware of with regard to legislation that passed this year, then I would invite you uh, to do that. And with that, let me now turn to Bill Fawcett uh, again. And Bill, do you want to talk about the 2024 studies and reports? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. Um, also coming out of the session, uh, the Maryland Insurance Administration was assigned uh, three reports this year. The first two relate to the Maryland Automobile Insurance Fund. The first one is to conduct a review of their filings during 2024. And the second one is to uh, assess the affordability factor used in their rate setting. 
Um, the, and we'll be working cooperatively with MAFE as we've done in the, in the past. The third study uh, that we have to conduct is one which involves the impact on insurance premiums of collisions with animals. Uh, and this is one where we'll probably be reaching out to you after we've done some in initial research uh, to see if we can determine how those animal strikes impact the, uh, the rates charged for uh, motor vehicle insurance. Um, those, were the, those were the three reports that we had. Um, Kathleen, I'll turn it back to you. Thanks, Bill. Appreciate it. Um, we're now going to take a moment to talk about cybersecurity filing. So, Mary. Okay, I do know someone has his hand raised, one of the participants. Do we want to address that? I think our plan was to take questions at the end. Okay. So if that's okay, we have look, look like we have a couple of people. I'm just going to ask your indulgence until we get to the end, and then we will take questions. Okay. Well, I am going to talk about two types of cybersecurity filings, one new this year and one that started previously. And so if you don't know what we're talking about, Section 33.103 of the insurance article requires carriers above a certain size to have in place an information security program and an incident response plan. Each year on or before April 15th, a certif certification of compliance with these requirements must be filed with the commissioner unless you meet the requirements for an exemption. And we have this certification form on our website. And this year was the first year that these certifications were due and we are working through verifying that each company that appears to be required to file did so. And so over the summer, we may be filed following up if we did not receive a filing to verify that you are exempt and that it was not an oversight or other issue. Records to support the certification are required to be kept for five years. And we are planning to retain a firm with the appropriate expertise to determine whether the information security plans comply with the substance of the law. And at that time, you may be asked to provide the information security plans to us for review. The other type of cybersecurity filing is an event report. And that is required if you are unfortunate enough to have a cybersecurity breach. And that is required by section 33105. We also have an online form for these submissions. And when you file one of those, we will follow up with you uh, to determine the severity. And you should expect to file the information security plans and incident response plans as part of the reporting. And I am thankful for everyone who has been cooperative in filing either or both of those reports as required. Thank you, Mary. I, I would just echo the fact that we really do appreciate the level of cooperation that we've seen thus far. As Mary mentioned, you know, they're still walking through and making sure that everybody who was supposed to file filed. But um, at least at first blush, there's been just, uh, and particularly for the first time through, there's been a great deal of cooperation. So thank you for that. Um, I, I just want to mention two things. Um, the first is with regard to the substance of your written plan. Um, it, as, as those of you who represent domestic carriers are aware, the MIA does, as part of its um, triennial financial examination, conducts an, an examination of cybersecurity control. So that is part of the NAIC financial examination toolkit and the cyber questionnaire. Um, when our law was changed here in Maryland, the that questionnaire was um, revised, adopted, updated, in order to assure that the review of the cybersecurity uh, protocols uh, within a domestic company meet the requirements of a written program in our statutory law. So for all companies, that is sort of a good yardstick around as we, in the market conduct end of things, when we might have occasion to look at 
a, um, an, an, a, a written program? And does the written program comply with state law? The standards that are being utilized by our financial examination unit will be consistent with the standards that our market conduct group will be looking at. So for those of you that are not domestic carriers, that will give you also, you know, an insight in where you can go for guidance as you are, you know, working through uh, your plans and to the extent, you know, from time to time, you're taking them out and looking at them from both a Maryland and, and, a, and a more general perspective. So, but I wanted to give you that information because that is a, a good guide for your compliance folks. Um, and our market conduct and insurance uh, um, and financial oversight teams are working together um, in making sure that there is consistency across the entire agency. Um, we, we, work, we, are work, we have been working our way out of divisional silos, and this is a great example um, of that. On the other side of the house, with respect to notice requirements and the kind of informational gathering exercise around uh, when an event occurs and then how the our administration will report to will, will respond to it, Mary and her team do an excellent job, and, and they base part of what they do on the NAIC's um, cyber um, event response plan that was adopted last year. I just want to give you a heads up, even though you are the PNC community, um, there is an ad hoc working group at the NAIC that is focused on the healthcare side and the change cybersecurity event. I reference that because Part of what that ad hoc group is going to be doing is using this unfortunate event as an opportunity to pilot a more coordinated collective information gathering exercise when there is a national cyber event so that companies do not get frankly peppered to death by every state that they operate in where they might have to file a notice. So we are highly aware of how difficult that is for a large company or a multi-state company. And part of this exercise is going to be evaluating what it means for companies to have to respond. And can regulators take some of the burden of repetition off by having a, a, a process that's more centralized? So I want to make you aware of that uh, so that uh, you can, first of all, track it with your life and health colleagues but also because as we complete the change pilot, that work will immediately move to the cybersecurity working group, probably within 2024, to begin to develop that program. So you'll, you'll want to keep your eyes on that um, at the national level. So with that, let me say thank you again to Mary and ask uh, Joy Hatchett. Uh, the Associate Commissioner for CEANU to give us the annual update on hurricane season. Thank you, Commissioner. And good afternoon to all of you. I'm sure you're used to getting this update every year, but this year we have a little bit of a twist in that I don't think most of you would have ever contemplated a bridge collapse being part of our disaster response. And I do want to echo everyone at the MIAs, thank you for all of the carriers that have provided accommodations, provided us information because this event truly impacted Marylanders and also people across the nation. So thank you so much. And along those lines, once again, it is, so important that our contacts and our ability to reach out to and talk to the correct people at your individual companies is so important. And I want to thank you because when I reached out, I heard from folks and I truly, truly appreciate that. And also, I think there were some folks who weren't used to dealing with us because I'm used to dealing with your CAT teams and I'm used to dealing with some of your principles in the claims process. But this time it involved conversations with others and Bill did a great job, but also you guys were not, um, if you had questions, you had no issues with reaching out to me. 
And that conversation and our ability to help Marylanders works both ways. So we truly do appreciate it. And for those of you that are on the CAT teams, I know you've all been looking at all of the uh, forecasts from NWS and the Hurricane folks. And they are forecasting one of the worst seasons that we've had in a long time. That said, it only takes one. So let's be ready once again this year to provide them. And yes, I do care about the entire nation, but my heart is with Maryland. So let's make sure then when our Maryland consumers need us, that we are there to support them. And let's continue the conversation. And if you have questions, always feel free to reach out. I'm gonna keep it short because you guys have heard me over and over again, and I'm sure you've got much more pressing issues and concerns. Thank you, Joy. Um, I appreciate that. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is, looks like uh, Matt and Nancy have their hands up, but let, let me go to a couple of other matters that weren't on the agenda, um, and then we'll hear from um, Matt and from Nancy and um, anyone else who wants to comment. I see that, I know that it says comments from industry, and I apologize because I didn't catch that. It really should be comments from anybody, um, whether you're affiliated with industry uh, or not. So I don't want to suggest that there's a limit on who can ask a question or, or who can comment. Um, but before we do that, uh, just a couple of quick things. Um, so I, I want you to be aware of as an industry of uh, three things that are happening at the MIA. One thing that's happening at the MIA is we are looking at um, a the development of a sort of a pilot process, if you will, in how we coordinate our data analytical functions and our actuarial functions. So uh, we have been working with a consultant for a while on improving our data analytical capabilities um, and bringing data science more formally into our work. Um, and the question is, how does that coordinate with what our actuaries already do? So the uh, Maryland is very active at the NAIC in answering these exact same questions that the H Committee is focused on this year. And you'll see us looking at that uh, in Maryland as well as part of a, a, of a project here. Uh, the second thing that I want to uh, give an update on is the rebuild of our enterprise systems. So we have been very actively engaged um, and we finally have, I feel like it's like breaking ground. I don't know, it's, it's taken us a long time to get here but we are in the first rollout of the first phase of our, what we've called our ITS uh, project. And that is delivering to the agency a whole new level of, um, of capabilities, uh, building on a, a, a database that is consistent throughout, having the ability for units to you know, work uh, across those databases and informational bases, um, having plug and play technology. It, it's, it's just a world of difference. Most importantly, it's allowing us to modernize our capabilities um, to improve our data, uh, frankly, our data management, our data governance, um, the, the use of portals, better use of electronic and the, the reduction of manual processes, all of this across all of our units um, over what will be about an 18 month build. Um, but I'm telling you this because I know one of the issues that we have had at the MIA is um, a backlog in our consumer complaints unit. And you know, since Bill arrived in October, you know, as he's gotten to know the processes and the people, one of the things that we've been working on, particularly, particularly arduously within the last three months has been plowing through that backlog and allowing cases to move forward uh, more swiftly, more efficiently. And um, to that end, uh, our, our processes are simplifying. We're gonna rely more and more on our Salesforce platform to move things along more quickly. So that will benefit not 
will benefit everybody, both at the agency and with respect to industry and being able to move things off of your books much more quickly. And consumers, of course, who will get responses uh, in a much more timely manner. We were assisted in this effort um, by the approval of five new PINs within the PNC unit, three of which are going to be focused on um, investigators and the investigative process. And Bill is working on those hires now. Um, and then the other thing that we've been trying to do across all of our divisions is sort of right size and make sure that the MIA has a single approach to both the language that it uses, what its orders look like, and what we call the decisions that we make. So we're going to be easing into those changes in process and those changes in labeling over the course of the next several months. But Bill, do you want to chat about that a little bit more? Yeah, thanks, Kathleen. As part of the effort to to look at what we what we do in our workflows and how we can be more efficient, what was clear to us is that we needed to be consistent with how we operate across the agency, as, as Kathleen has said. For, in in particular, that means for the PNC unit, where we've been issuing determination letters, we use we've been using a determination letter to both find no violation and a violation. In going forward, what we'll do is we'll start operating the way we used to and the way the rest of the, the agency operates, where a determination letter will be used for findings of no violation, and an order will be used for those situations where a, a violation is found. And uh, as Kathleen also mentioned, we'll be easing into this. I've already spoken to some of you about blocks of complaints and um, you know how, how we're going to move forward and how we'd like to do it. And so we'll take a, a measured and reasonable approach to this. There'll be nothing dramatic. And that's why we wanted to talk to you both now and to some of you individually about how we're, how we're going to move forward rather than just uh, putting it out there. But again, it's a move that will bring uniformity to, to how we proceed. And it will also bring some speed and I think some... Uh, a better process for for everybody, uh, for your uh, for your companies, for our consumers, and for for the division. I think things will start moving a lot faster once we're we've got some uniformity. Thank you, Bill. And you know, just to let you know, as part of the ITS program and project, there are are all of the basics, right? The document management, the scanning functions, the, all of those kinds of things that. You know, the MIA just suffers from from not having, um, but and as we update those things, but a very concrete example of what Bill's group is is exploring right now is how to make your form filing process faster and easier by using technologies that that scan and identify. So um, there are some states that have had some success with some of those products. We're looking at what they're doing and we're piloting that, um, you know, some of those programs here as well. So all of this is in service of being able to do more work faster and more efficiently with the, you know, the folks that we have and being able to deliver product, deliver, um, you know, responses in a much more timely manner. And, you know, to the extent that technology can help us do that, just like you use technology to help you be more operationally efficient, we need to be able to do that. And we, we need to do that as regulators as well. So, Bill, I, I also want to particularly thank your leadership in, in bringing a whole new dimension of sort of PNC's participation in the IT as product. And I, I think it's already bearing, um, already bearing good fruit. So thank you and to your team for that openness. Thank you. So with that, let me, I'm not sure who went first. So um, I'm just going to go by the alphabet. So uh, Egan is before Hauser. So uh, Nancy, could we invite you to ask your questions? Come on camera if you can. Hi. <laughs> uh, good afternoon, everyone. And thanks for holding the meeting today. And um, I am just going to say on the behalf of everyone and my members how much we're going to miss you, Kathleen. I know you're returning to private practice, but, you know, we've had just a great relationship and you've done so much at the NAIC. We just want to thank you for all your hard work and we look forward to working with you as you return to private practice. But I know we're clapping. Everyone is out here. 
Um, the well, two thank you. You're clapping when you're not like smacking the snot out of me at the moment <laughs> on the E committee, but I. Uh, I <laughs> that is uh, another part say, of my group. And, and I, I'm just, I really am saying that tongue in cheek and with oh, no. great affection because, you know, truly it is what it is and it'll be what it'll be. But I did, but I, I could not resist that. So. <laughs> <laughs> but I will I will report back to that NARC team and tell them that. <laughs> um, well, first of all, and uh, Jamie, I, I I don't see you up there, but um, I want to thank you. I, I the bulletin came out. I think that addressed our concerns. If they have the form filed by June thirtieth, then it'll be deemed that it's been approved, and that will make sure they're in compliance by uh, July one, which was one of the other concerns. Um, I did have a um, question from one of my members about a law that had nothing really to do with the bills that you all passed, but it had to do with the home improvement contractors. Um, if you hold on one second, I had it in front of me, but I've lost my place. I apologize. Uh, it was the new bill, House Bill 738, Senate Bill 806, which was requiring them all to carry a higher limit of general liability from what is the current amount to 500,000 um, and Bill, thank you for leaving a message on my uh, voicemail over the weekend. Um, I think uh, Bill reached out to the Maryland Home Improvement Commissioner and they're supposed to be sending out an email to all the contractors letting them know about the higher limits requirement uh, for all contractors and that uh, they will be posting something on their website. I, I didn't see it yet, but I know that they said it was June 1st and um, it's not there yet, but I want to thank you for that. So I'm sort of answering my own questions that I submit. <laughs> those are the best, those are the best kind, Nancy. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> Nancy, if we can, if we can help in any way um, in boosting it on our social media platforms or putting it on our website or making it part of consumer alert. If you want to coordinate with Bill, Jamie, and Craig about that, okay. know, we, we we often help our fellow agencies get the word out. In fact, Bill and I were just having this esoteric conversation today about what is an advisory versus what is a bulletin. So we would be happy to issue an advisory about that change. In That'd limits. be great. And I, and I just want to uh, say, um, you know, we've been working in other states. Obviously, I'm mid-Atlantic. And uh, some of the material you're using about trying to get people to understand uh, both the home improvement contractor and the public adjuster about what's permitted and not permitted. And, you know, we run into this issue with um, particularly with roofing contractors um, acting as sort of public adjusters. And you've, you've provided a lot of different insurance advisory, and I think you're working with the NFIB as well. Um, we've been trying to pull as many of your templates together and advisories uh, to present to other insurance departments um, to kind of use to uh, put the word out in their communities. Um, so uh, once again, thank you very much for all the work you've done on that so far. So that, that's all I have. And I will take you the the tongue in cheek back uh, to certain folks. <laughs> no, I don't mind. I don't mind. I can't I'm wait. Happy. I'm leaving, so they can put it all on me. Yeah, that's right. Not I don't offend anybody else. <laughs> but anyway, thank you, and thanks for everyone for hosting the meeting today. Thanks. You're welcome. And I think Matt. Hey, Matt. How are you, Mr. Hauser? Good. Thank you, Commissioner. Um, Today, I start my 52nd year in the insurance business, um, 30, 30 years on the corporate side and the last 20 plus as, a, as an agent. Um, my question, I have two today. The first one, could you just um, give a brief update? I think there was legislation, um, private pasture auto legislation that um, for uninsured motorists, and I, I think July 1st, enhanced becomes the default. I believe that's correct. And my second question is, I just wonder what type of oversight the um, administration is giving to companies um, as far as their analytics and their use of artificial intelligence, just to make sure we're not becoming discriminatory. So I'm going to answer your second question first. So the second question is that, um, you you may have seen that the administration issued a bulletin uh, about a month and a half ago 
which essentially adopted the uh, model bulletin that was a, that was adopted by the NAIC, right? So the purpose of that bulletin is to make it clear to our regulated entities that when they engage in regulated conduct, which conduct is pretty much all of the conduct that they engage in that has um, significant consumer impact, right? So underwriting, rating, you know, marketing, claims, et cetera. So when you are making a decision that is subject to regulatory standards, we expect those decisions to comply with those regulatory standards, regardless of the methodology that you choose to use to facilitate those decisions. So if you are using a super complex, you know, predictive model as part of your rating plan, well, the law allows you to do that as long as you meet all of the all of the standards. So the question then always becomes, okay, well, how do you determine in advance of a violation that the model is going to allow the company to make decisions, that machine's going to work, right? And that it's not going to cause the company to then violate the laws. That's one big question. And then the second big question is, how do you actually find the pattern of bias or unfair discrimination when you are hunting and pecking through individual events? So. I wish I had a crystal ball and could give you a clean, perfect answer to that question because the answers are evolving over time and technology. However, the approach that we've taken at the national level and that we're taking here in Maryland is to require that companies that utilize these systems, utilize artificial intelligence systems to make regulated decisions with impacts on consumers have to have a written program about how they are developing or deploying that technology. And the bulletin lays out the um, chapters, if you will, that the program should address. So what are the issues that should be addressed? Now, every company is going to address them differently because, you know, great big AIG companies and great big huge national companies operate very differently and use AI very differently than a little single monoline company. Some little single monoline companies are super digital. Others are not. So the approach that the bulletin takes is to say, you need to address governance. You need to address risk management. Within those topics, there are lots of topics you should be talking about as part of your program, your data, your data governance, your data provenance, your data management, thinking about security, thinking about privacy, working through issues such as what kinds of validation type testings are you able to do? You know, what are your escalation protocols? Who's part of the decisional team? When do you decide something is going to be, a problem is going to be solved using an AI type model? And when you decide that, who, what is the scope and how narrow is the approach? So all of those kind of good governance, risk management considerations that NIST identified within their framework, we relied heavily on the NIST framework in developing the NAIC model, which has been adopted in Maryland. So right now today, there is no one size fit all. There is no magic number. There is no specific trigger that says, if this, then that, because this type of technology is not really, does not really lend itself to that degree of prescription. But what we have done is laid out, I think, very clear principles that you act in our state, you follow our rules. And when you act in our state using certain types of technology, you have to have controls in place for the use of that technology. And those controls have to be reduced to writing in a program that meets certain standards. And the second part, the last part of the bulletin says, when we have reason to believe that you are utilizing technology or frankly, any methodology, right? In order to make decisions that appear to have some form of an illegal impact, then here are the kinds of things we're going to be asking you for that we expect you to have. So that is a very long-winded um, explanation for how, at least today, the Maryland Insurance Administration is evaluating the use of AI by carriers. And when we do get, and Mary Quay's team has gotten um, complaints where we have gone in to look at 
the a, a carrier's use of um, AI systems or AI technologies in their process. Then we evaluate what they're doing, how they're doing it, and when necessary, we engage a consultant to assist us in understanding the uh, propriety of the data or understanding the using statistics, the impacts that we can discern about the utilization of the model um, and whether ultimately it runs afoul of any of the standards that the carrier is held to with respect to that decision. Does that answer your second question? Excellent. I am going to defer to a combination, I think, of Joy and Bill on the EUIM implementation yeah. that is coming about. So I, I'll let you two handle that okay. topic. Thanks, thanks, Kathy. Yeah, Matt, good question. So that's the enhanced UIM coverage that came out last year and that becomes effective on the first. What might be helpful for you is that we posted a uh, an FAQ on this last month after talking with uh, industry members and getting their specific questions. Uh, and so I think I think you'll find that is, is helpful on our website. I'll ask uh, Craig to put it into the chat link for you. Uh, Joy, did you wanna add to that? So when you're speaking with consumers, we have a consumer advisory that's very helpful also, we're doing a series of virtual presentations. So if any of your customers would like to attend those, that's an excellent basic, basic way for them to try to get their arms around a difficult topic. So I think a combination of the consumer, not the, co the company item is great for the companies and the industry. But from my perspective, if you're trying to explain this to the everyday consumer, the consumer advisory, and then offering them to actually attend one of the virtual presentations is a great way for them to wrap their arms around this complicated topic. Okay. Well, um, specifically, so my understanding is as of July 1st, um any any new business not necessarily renewals not renewals correct not apply to renewals right so for new business the default offer has to be enhanced and i can you know yes, that's I, correct and i understand how to explain that so i do a lot of um personal auto business in the state and a lot of you know the company provided uh, quoting software currently defaults to not the enhanced. Right. So should I, I guess I would expect that the company will change their programming so that myself and my agents are automatically offering or quoting. Well, I would suggest to you that that is a question for the industry. That is what they, they, they have to have a mechanism in place by which if the consumer does not opt into one of the other options that they will automatically receive the EIUM. So, you know, how that is being distributed throughout distribution systems, um, we, I don't know, and we have not gotten involved. Um, so if you find an impediment as you as that data is coming up and it's problematic and we can facilitate discussions around how to make sure that's happening, that would be great. I will tell you that there is a mandatory form that has to be presented with data in it to the consumer. So, you know, when you look at it, then and the MIA uh, develop that and we publish that by bulletin. So the, the, I am, I, I, at least as far as systems go, the companies have got to have filed their forms and have their systems programmed to be able to accommodate that as part of the application because it's a mandatory part of the application. How that's getting to you, I, that I don't know. Bill, did you want to add anything? Yes, yeah, sure. that was because that was Bill was. 
Yeah, that's exactly right, Kathleen. Um, what we were, what Phil and I were talking about is attached to the original bulletin. There's a worksheet that that actually will walk you through option one, two, and three, and what needs to be filled in. And I think that that will be instructive. That's been sent to all of the industry members as well, and they're they're updating their systems for that. Um, and, and I believe a, a good bit of that was mandated by the legislation, and and our job was pretty much just implementing what the statute required. Yeah. It, it's updated the form. Like today you get a form that, you know, is whatever the mandatory offering. The new form makes it clear that, you know, it, but you still it's still the form that has to be given to the insurer. It just makes it clear that if you don't check off something else, what you're going to get is EIUM and it, it will sit, let the person know up front um, information about costing. So anything else or any other questions from anyone else? I don't see anything. I don't see any hands raised. Mm -hmm. So with that, let me just close the meeting out and let me close it out with a sincere thank you. So this is probably the last time that I'll kind of address this group in this format. So I just want to tell you what a, a great journey it's been. Thank you, Nancy, for your kind words. I've, you know, just met an incredible group of people outside. I mean, I, the, the people at the MIA are so close to my heart, I can't even talk about it because I'll just start crying. It was a really bittersweet decision for me um, to make the decision not just to go back to Piper, to go back to Piper on July uh, 1st. Um, I had been deferring it for 18 months and the time was just, you know, sort of now or never. So, um, but I will uh, not only miss the team at the MIA terrifically and the, the folks at the NAIC, but um, I will miss our interactions because they've been really great interactions. And I've, I've learned really, you know, so much. Um, the good news is that the real talent here, the real dream team at the MIA is all, are all still here. And so these are the folks who you've spoken to today. And as you move through the agency that you know, and the MIA is really blessed with having such a really significant, stable workforce. And most people who've been here for a really, really long time, people tend to retire from here as opposed to zipping in and out. And that's a real statement, I think, about the culture that these people uh, who are here have created over the years. So um, it's really been my pleasure to be in this position. It's been particularly sweet for me um, to have had a job that, you know, my dad had and to sit at his desk, um, you know, for a period of time. So that's been particularly precious to me. But uh, I just want to say thanks to all of you in industry for all the information you've provided, the generosity of your time, both at the national, at the state level, and as difficult as this costing environment is, and as difficult as the rate conversations are and the increases are, and they're only going to get more difficult, um, I will also say that this community of carriers has come together time and time and time and time again to help consumers. You did it during the pandemic. It was amazing. Um, you did it in so many, you're doing it today for, for a number of carriers that are really taking time to let people who've been decimated by the bridge collapse to take some of the necessary time they need with their um, with their premium payments. And so this is an industry that I think responds over and over again. And I really appreciated the opportunity to be part of that and to see it in action and, and be able to champion it. Uh, before the legislature, you know, as we've seen the kinds of things that the industry has done to support Marylanders over the last several years. So thank you for that. And I think with that, that closes us out for today. And um, I'll see you all around.